affect uh, their ability to perform more and more activities of uh, daily living. Uh, as a reminder, I know, uh, I believe the report came out a week or so ago. Uh, we're now at 250,000 people that have been determined eligible for the private option. Uh, we also are going through the process now and beginning the redetermination. I know uh, Director Sue is going to talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later, so I won't go into that in great detail. But uh, I do just want to update that of the 250,000 that have been determined eligible, uh, approximately 242,000 have enrolled, uh, and of that, a uh, little over 24,000 have been identified as medically frail. Well, that's pretty consistent with what we've seen in the past, which is approximately 20, excuse me, approximately 10 percent of the population. We've got a question before we move on. Representative Hammer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And maybe I overlooked it, but do you have the cost, the total cost for what the medically frail population? We're in? coming to that. I just, I wanted to make sure because I know that there's lots of questions, even meetings I've had over the past few weeks about how does somebody become identified as medically frail, what is that process? So I thought it would be helpful to take a couple minutes and kind of talk through how that process mm -hmm. works and then dig into the cost in comparison to traditional Medicaid. All right, follow-up question, Mr. Chair. Sure. On page three of your, or the handout, it's the uh, demographics and utilization. What does traditional Medicaid serve, or who does traditionally Medicaid serve? That's 66 percent of beneficiaries are ages 20 and under, yet they account for only 45 percent of the spend. Can you expand on that? Give me a better, uh, give me a, help me grasp what that means and how it applies. Certainly. So in general, as I, was, as I was saying, you know, when you look at our traditional Medicaid program, most of whom we serve uh, are primarily children, um, uh, in the past, historically pregnant women, and then those individuals that typically fall within what we call the aged, blind, or disabled category. You know, th those folks that could not be served, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, traditionally through a private carrier, but really need, to, really need to be served through Medicaid so they can get access to more of those intensive services, whether it's nursing homes, uh, you know, or some of our um, in intermediate care facilities. But when we talk about that 66%, I mean, that really represents children primarily uh, within the traditional Medicaid program. Children ages, what, what ages is, are the, uh, are the, So we serve um, from birth in terms of newborns, and then uh, the Our Kids program goes up to 19. Do you know how many, uh, you can't track how many multiple births in one home there are that attribute to that number, can you? Uh, I don't have that. We can certainly look at it. In general, um, you know, in terms of, we, we can see, for example, if Medicaid has paid for a birth, but in any given home, we may pay for one, none, or all. So in general, that's not something we have tracked, but we can certainly take a look at it. Did you ever use to track that information? Um, not, not to my knowledge on the Medicaid side, we, but we, I can certainly check. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, so as I was saying, just wanted to talk a little bit about the process uh, for when someone is determined medically frail. Uh, when they come you know, to the portal, first to be able to uh, apply for coverage, um, uh, if they are deemed uh, eligible um, for coverage through the private option, they're then asked to complete a 12-question screening tool uh, that really looks at assessing uh, their medical frailty and whether or not they could best be served in Medicaid. Um, those responses are then analyzed. We look at whether or not the person meets the medically frail or exceptional needs criteria. And then if they are determined medically frail or is having exceptional needs, they'll be enrolled uh, in Medicaid. Um, a couple things to note about the screen. Uh, it is perspective at the time of enrollment, uh, meaning that um, we are asking people questions, things such as the number of hospitalizations they've had within the past year, whether or not they have difficulty with their activities of daily living, such as brushing their teeth, um, you know, showering, bathing themselves, those kinds of things. Um, it's also offered annually, both at enrollment and re-enrollment to all applicants, uh, whoever would like to take that screen. Uh, and then, you know, in the instance where somebody perhaps may not have had an issue when they first came into the private option, you know, perhaps were healthy and then throughout the year something happened uh, and they happened to have a, a very significant or complex medical issue arise, we also have a process for mid-year determinations where we can then work with the carriers, review their status, and determine if they would be best served within the traditional Medicaid program. Can, can you explain to me the rationale behind so these people are not are, are people who by income are not eligible for traditional Medicaid but they're medically frail is that correct right so uh, the rationale behind taking these people and putting them taking them off of insurance policies and putting them in Medicaid when it's a higher state match 
Well, actually, it's a good question. So it's important. I know when people talk about sort of private option, you know, many people think about the qualified health plans and Blue Cross and basically what's offered through the exchange. What's important is that even though this population is served through Medicaid, um, they're actually part of what was in our original 1115 demonstration waiver. So all of the costs that are being accrued for this population to date are still at that 100% federal match. So, okay, so it has, we, we still get the 100% match, but we're going with a fee-for-service traditional Medicaid program in an effort to do what? Well, the, the history with that is that, um, you know, I think early on, uh, when the waiver was being developed, you know, there were concerns, particularly from um, the carriers, that, you know, they really wanted to focus on serving individuals who are generally healthy, and that, you know, if we had a number of folks who perhaps, um, you know, had complex medical conditions and we're putting them, you know, inside uh, the private market as well, uh, it, might, it might increase the rates beyond the point that it would no longer be considered feasible uh, in terms of to best serve the majority of the folks within the population. So, the decision was made to have a process where those folks who really could best be served in Medicaid because of the services they need, uh, the type of complexity of their situation, that there would be a process where they could um, be served through Medicaid uh, as opposed to uh, through the private carriers. Won't, won't the people get the same services regardless? It's just a question whether the insurance company is paying for it or whether the taxpayers are paying for it. It's, it's a great question. The, the, the key difference, and um, we'll talk through that here in a second, um, if you are within a qualified health plan, you know, in terms of Blue Cross, and Better Qual Choice, et cetera, uh, you have to meet the 10 essential health benefits, you know, certainly as we heard Dr. Chang and others talk about uh, earlier today. Um, and that really, for most people, um, you know, for most people who are generally healthy, um, that should really meet you know, the majority of their needs. For others, for example, you know, who come in as medically frail, they may have significant behavioral health needs, you know, as we'll see here in a minute. Uh, they may also have some serious uh, medical complexity, whether it's uh, you know, issues around uh, heart disease, cancer, those types of things, which, which really they would get some coverage within the qualified health plans, but particularly if they need like long-term care and supports, um, uh, like something you might get through one of our waivers, uh, really it's best, it's best for them to be served through Medicaid because those services aren't available in the private market, at least not typically. Okay, Representative Hammer, you have a question. The guidelines for determining whether somebody is medically frail or not, is that established by the feds, by the state, and do we as a state have any latitude to, to say anything different? It would be all of the above. <laughs> but the, uh, so the background on that is that um, we've worked with, in the past, um, researchers to develop the screen as, as, you know, since we were the first state to do this, the idea was trying to figure out what could we use as a prospective tool to really be able to identify people both now who are, um, uh, who have significant health issues, but also looking at those people who um, potentially, based on the behaviors they're exhibiting, based on uh, the, the frequency of their interactions with the medical system, would be best served, um, you know, outside of the qualified health plans. And so, um, as, as we've done that, um, you know, it's certainly something certainly that the, the federal government has had to review as part of the waiver. Uh, it's something that, you know, we've brought, um, um, you know, we, we've, we've worked with stakeholders within the state to be able to uh, make sure that we're not, uh, we're not, you know, inadvertently excluding or including, you know, too many or too little people. But that's definitely something that at the state level we do have the opportunity to review and make modifications as necessary. So when they're, def when they're defined as medically frail, the federal government picks up 100 percent of the tab? That's correct. Okay. Um, asset testing was mentioned a while ago by the Stevens Group, and then you just mentioned it. Did, were, you in the, were you in the room when they were testifying? A minute, I was, yes. I, you mean asset? So I don't, I don't know, I guess, when I referenced asset testing. <laughs> okay. Well, and that's part of what I've, it sounded like they said that we could include asset testing as part of the, the scrubbing process and right. all the things that went through. But what I heard you just say a minute ago kind of gave me a, and I've, I thought I've heard in the past we couldn't use asset testing when dealing with certain populations. So can, you, can we or can we not from your perspective? We, we can. There are some populations where um, basically we have to first um, you know, sort of accept their word, but we can definitely always go back and we do, we check behind to make sure that what they've told us is accurate and can be verified. Uh, I think to what, I don't want to speak for the Stevens Group or others, I think what, what, they're, what they're referring to I think is a much more intensive effort where as opposed to where 
we ask somebody, what is your income, for example, what assets do you have, and then we try to verify that through our existing systems. Um, there are other opportunities out there where some of these vendors can look at you know, banking information, they can look at um, Department of Motor Vehicles, that kind of stuff, and really do a full scan uh, and say whether or not somebody has assets outside the state, within the state. Um, you know, it really helps to be able to enhance some of those resources as opposed to just asking people to verify and then for us to have to go out and kind of, you know, you know, look at what they've given us. So what I hear you saying is the state can do it to this level, but what we're talking about getting from the Stevens Group can be done to this level. Is that a fair analysis? Right. I don't want to speak for the, the Stevens okay. Group, but I All do right. think I do think yes. I mean, in terms of, I think that there definitely are some opportunities above and beyond uh, probably the level of verification that we provide today within the Medicaid program. Request to the chair, please. I'd like to ask, unless she's fixing to get to it, I'd like to ask that we review. Uh, that list that determines whether somebody is medically frail or not, that, that what's being referred to that we set aside some time as a committee or I'll ask for her, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. But I think it'd be interesting to see that list that determines whether somebody is actually medically frail or not because if we've got any leverage at all as a state as we move forward with the Stevens Group, I think it'd be interesting to know if there's some areas that we may want to look at tweaking or including in the changes in the future. Don, Don can get that together and we'll-, we'll Absolutely, be, we'll yeah. be happy to provide that. Okay, Senator Bledsoe, you have a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in assets testing, I thought that was a state option that by a vote of the House and the Senate, we could declare whether we wanted to remove that or not. Is that incorrect? No, that, that is something we can do for, for specific programs, so you are correct. All right, and then yes or no to this. Let's, I, I think I've heard it two or three times, but I, I would like to put it in a simple form. The people that are eligible for the private option who would not be eligible for Medicaid, but who are medically fragile are then put on Medicaid. Is that correct? Yes, so the people who are determined medically frail, uh, they are then, uh, they then come in and basically are offered services through the traditional Medicaid program. There's, there's two different options they can choose, but be happy to give some more information on that um, at a later date or if, if, if individuals have questions. But basically, yes, once they're determined medically frail, then, then it's determined that they are best served through the traditional Medicaid program. But they would not qualify otherwise from traditional Medicaid. Not at this point. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that we've seen, um, and certainly I know there's been individuals such as, you know, Arthur Boudier and others from the Social Security Administration who have um, presented in the past, you know, I, I think there is, there is the case where individuals who perhaps uh, may have been going through the SSI process to get determined, um, both perhaps from an income perspective, but also for coverage in terms of Medicaid, um, you know, we have seen some difference in our numbers, and I know we'll be reporting on that within the next month or so. But so you could see individuals who might otherwise go through the SSI determination process, as an example, who now, because that process can take such a long time, uh, are coming in uh, on the private option side and being determined medically frail. Don, can I, can I just see if I can understand this? Because I, I think we, we, we often use a word to mean two different things at the same time. So in one sense, there is being on Medicaid, meaning traditional Medicaid, right. and meaning expanded population. And then separately, we use qualified health plans versus fee-for-service, and then we call fee-for-service Medicaid. So there's two distinctions. One is the traditional population. The second is the expanded population. And then there's fee-for-service versus a qualified health plan. So if somebody is not qualified for the Medicaid traditional population, they may be in the expanded population. That would be this individual. And then he or she goes to the screener and may be qualified for a health plan, which is what we think of as the private option, or for traditional fee-for-service, which we can also call Medicaid. So you could have Medicaid, 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 but it means two different things. It does, and the big difference, to your point, is going to be around the match rates, because as we said, if, if it's somebody who really would have been in traditional Medicaid before expansion, you know, that is, that is at the 70-30 rate, versus if you are a newly eligible in the expansion population, medically frail or not, it would be at the 100% rate currently. Uh, but, again, you could be eligible for the private option, but not for Medicaid until you're deemed 
medically fragile, then you can, from that private option population, then be put on traditional Medicaid. Yes, if you have health needs that, that would require being served outside of the private option, then you could be, best be served through Medicaid. And that's 100%? That is correct. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Don, I'm just going to interrupt you real quick because I know some of us on the House side have got to go back in session. I understand at 2.30, if I'm not mistaken. So we're, we're just going to keep going, and I apologize to the House members, but it, it, we'll, we'll, we'll leave and exit in time to go to the House and then come back, and we'll just keep the process going and apologize to the House members for doing it that way. Yeah, and we'll obviously you'll have access to the materials and the, the tape if you want to go back through it. but. Uh and it's live streaming so you can watch it while you're on the floor. All right, uh, we got a couple more questions here real quick before we press on, Don. Representative Ferguson, you recognize? Hello, oh, I got it, <laughs> thank you. Uh, to Senator Bledsoe's point, I, I know we have moved those medically frail people to Medicaid. Do we, do we have enough uh, information yet to know, has that driven up the cost in Medicaid of per member per month or per member per year? Do we have those numbers? That's one of the things that we're looking at. We didn't have it um, ready for this meeting. I know it's something that the Stevens Group is interested in as well, so we're working with them to best define how do we account for that per member per year cost. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what we will be able to show you, uh, you know, as I said, is a little bit about where are the greatest costs uh, in terms of from a category of service perspective, um, and then we can talk a little bit about um, which categories are being used most frequently. But that's definitely something that we want to bring to you in the future. Well, and, and I know I said this at one of the other meetings, but I, I do think we have to be careful about comparing apples to apples. Yes. That because we do have such a low threshold and a, 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 a very sick population on Medicaid, when you're comparing that to other states whose Medicaid may go up to 200% of poverty and includes essentially our private option mm -hmm. people, I think that's a very different number. It's very important. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, Representative Farrar, you're recognized for a question. And members, what we're going to do, because uh, there's some items here coming up the House members do want to participate in, so we're going to take a, we're going to give the House 20 or 30 minutes to get their work done, so we'll take a pause. <laughs> and as, e as efficient as they are, I'm sure that shouldn't be a problem. So we'll, we'll take a short break at, uh, here and just after, after Representative Farrar's question. Don't touch it. Oh, good. Ah, so you're learning quick. Uh, in the determination of the medically frail, are we still using the 12 question questionnaire or is there other ways that we're doing it now? Uh, it's at the beginning of the process. It is the, it is the, the 12 questions. Uh, but as I said, we also have the process where mid-year, if somebody comes to us and they've suddenly had some significant health issues and can't be served inside the, the qualified health plans, Blue Cross or others, uh, then we have a process for looking at that and potentially bringing them in uh, as medically frail. What, what qualifies as significant? You know, it's going to depend on a number of things. Uh, it's not just cost. I know that's a question that um, we often get. It's really looking at um, the complexity of their needs and really coming down to whether or not, based on the needs they have, uh, whether those services are available uh, through the private carriers in terms of through the qualified health plans or if that's something that really is only available in Medicaid. So things such as if they need waiver services uh, in terms of for home and community based care, uh, or if they need uh, intensive um, services supports in terms of um, they have uh, you know, severe and persistent mental illness, um, those types of things. But, but you answered that at the, at the very first on the 12 questionnaire. What, what changes between that and the time you reevaluate? Re I mean, lot, lots of things could happen. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, whether it's somebody, you know, suddenly they've had an issue that's um, perhaps a medical condition that's, you know, been kind of, you know, under check for some time, and then suddenly, you know, it blows up, uh, you know, halfway through the year. Uh, you also have issues, particularly if you look at like behavioral health, where somebody who, in the past, because they didn't have, um, they didn't have uh, ongoing access and treatment to care, where you know they may not have necessarily gotten treated, uh, and then you get halfway through the year, and suddenly you may have you may have, you know, psychiatric issues arise and you may need some severe and intensive support. Right. So I guess to uh, Senator Bledsoe's question, so you do take them off the private option, put them back on Medicaid then? If they meet the criteria. Right. So basically that you're actually artificially deflating the cost of the private option plans. 
No, I mean, because those costs, I mean, in, in terms of there's the costs inside the plans, uh, and, and, you know, the idea was always from the beginning that, you know, we wanted to have those plans really focus on individuals who were, um, you know, primarily healthy, didn't have significant um, types of medical issues. Uh, the idea is that those individuals, um, you know, like I said, they're still included as part of the waiver, so it's not that we're cost shifting in terms of trying to deflate the marketplace, we're rather just trying to best serve those individuals, because the match rate's still the same, it's just a matter of trying to best serve those individuals if they can't be effectively served through the, through the private carriers. And what would the private carriers not offer that Medicaid does? Well, basically, it's anything that's going to be outside of those 10 essential health benefits. Um, so, you know, they are required, like taking as an example, somebody who has, um, you know, behavioral health needs. If it's somebody who needs just, you know, some regular ongoing treatment, maybe they need therapy, you know, once a week, once a month, those kinds of things, that's generally something that can be handled inside, you know, of a, of a private carrier but, to the qualified but health plans. That, but is it mental health one of the 10 essential benefits? It is. But okay, then why would you take them off and put them on Medicaid then? I well, it's, it's not so much taking them off and putting them on Medicaid. It's the issue that because their needs may be so severe that the services they need, like if they need psychiatric hospitalizations, if they need to be inside an inpatient facility, things that are not available uh, inside of the, of the private carriers through the qualified health plans, that's something where they could best be served through Medicaid. And so um, once they complete that screener, if we determine they meet the criteria, we would bring them into the Medicaid program. But the, the qualified health care plans wouldn't pay for that at all? They pay for many of those services, but like I said, if it gets to a point where it's so extreme that that person really can't be appropriately served in the private plans, we don't want to do a disservice to them or to the carriers, and so we want to be able to get them best served inside Medicaid. But I will say this again, but if it's 100% covered under the private plans, why would we put it under Medicaid? Well, it's not so much that we wouldn't put it under Medicaid, it's more the issue that through the marketplace, you know, in terms of where the carriers have to, um, you know, compete, you know, for the covered lives, they're only required to provide those 10 essential health benefits. Nothing, you know, nothing more in terms of, I mean, some do, and we definitely appreciate that, but, but really when you have somebody who has significant needs that, quite frankly, um, because of those needs, um, would probably be eligible for traditional Medicaid, you know, we go ahead and bring them into that program because it's, it's you know, it, it could be detrimental to them if they're not getting the services that they need. It sounds like you're cost shifting. You're taking you're taking a, a, out of the private option, which is supposed to recover 100% of this, and, and it's a part of the nine essential benefits, especially if it's mental health. Then we're taking them off that and putting them into a Medicaid, which everybody says the Medicaid is not as good as the the, uh, the qualified health plans that we're putting out to them. It doesn't make sense to me. It seems like to me that's cost shifting. I, I can definitely understand where the perception may be, um, but I mean, this is something that had been worked out in the, in the original waiver negotiations, uh, and I think really as a way to try and help support the marketplace. You know, as we've seen, you know, particularly over the past, you know, the past couple years um, since the program's been in effect, I think with having, you know, generally these, um, you know, healthy covered lives inside the marketplace, it's actually helped to decrease the rates of, in, or decrease the cost of premiums uh, and, and the cost of the plans overall. Right. But that's not necessarily because, like I said, because the medically frail is only about 10% of that population. It's, like, it's approximately, like I said, at this point, it's about 24,000 people. But if we didn't cost shift them back down there, then our premium costs would be so high that the private option would be over budget neutral. Okay, I'm not I, I think we've pretty well kind of hammered this okay. to this point. Well, I'm I think sorry. I think everybody I've got to go. Thank I, you. I think we know what's uh, I think we know what's going on here. But Don, if you'll just wouldn't mind pausing sure. for a little bit, we'll give everybody uh, like I say, we will go no later than three o'clock, and if they get done sooner than that, uh, we'll start sooner. But I know it's a long day, but. Uh,